Well, we're starting a new sermon series today. And uh, the reality is that if you want something done, ask someone busy. Have you found this to be true? I know it's true in my own life. When I've got a day that's super busy, meetings back to back, and all of a sudden I have a five minute window my heart, my mind, my soul explodes with all the possibilities. What could I do with those five minutes? I could make a phone call, go to the grocery store, start a small business. <laughs> the sky is the limit on a busy day. But when I have a month of vacation, I think to myself, how am I going to ever empty the dishwasher? Maybe next week I'll get to it. And it goes to this equation. Which of the engineers in the house knows what equation this is? Come on. This is Sir Isaac Newton's first law of motion. Almost over, over uh, 300 years old. And what it says in Plain, Alabama, is that you are either in a rut or in the groove. An object either stays at rest or stays in motion. And it's one of the fundamental laws, not only of physics, but of our lives. And the fact of the matter is, we are more in motion than we ever have been before. Life is just getting busier and busier. If you've got a family of five, you're all doing five different things on a Tuesday. Don't talk to me about Wednesday. It's kind of like what Pastor Hunsaker was preaching on last month about being a wilderness people. A people that has gone from living on the farm where you get up and do the same thing day after day after day to becoming almost like a Bedouin, wandering people, spending as much time in our cars as we do in our homes having to forage for food at the nearest Chick-fil-A. So the reality is that if you want to have a spiritual experience, if you want to connect with God, we can't expect that life is just going to naturally slow down. An object in motion stays in motion. Lives in motion stay in motion. So, if we're going to meet God, we're going to have to meet Him on the way. As we see in today's scripture passage, taken from Mark chapter 5. When Jesus had again crossed over by boat to the other side of the lake, a large crowd gathered around Him while He was by the lake. Then one of the synagogue leaders named Jairus came, and when he saw Jesus, he fell at His feet. He pleaded earnestly with him, My little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her, so she will be healed and live. So Jesus went with him. A large crowd followed and pressed around him. And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had. Yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak. Because she thought, if I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. Immediately, her bleeding stopped and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. At once, Jesus realized that power had gone out from him. He turned around in the crowd and asked, Who touched my clothes? You see the people crowding against you, his disciples answered. And yet you ask, Who touched me? But Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. Then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet and trembling with fear, told him the whole truth. He said to her, Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be free from your suffering. While Jesus was still speaking, some people came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue leader, 
Your daughter is dead, they said. Why bother the teacher anymore? Overhearing what they said, Jesus told him, Don't be afraid, just believe. He did not let anyone follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. And when they came to the home of the synagogue leader, Jesus saw a commotion with people crying and wailing loudly. He went in and said to them, Why all this commotion and wailing? The child is not dead, but asleep. But they laughed at him. After he put them all out, he took the child's father and mother and the disciples who were with him, and he went in where the child was. He took her by the hand and said to her, Talitha kum, which means, little girl, I say to you, get up. Immediately, the girl stood up and began to walk around. She was 12 years old, and at this, they were completely astonished. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. It's hard to imagine a guy who was having a busier day than Jesus on that day. And I know in my own life when I'm busy, there is no holiday more important than today, which is Daylight Savings Day. This is the day when Benjamin Franklin told us that all young fathers get one extra hour of sleep, which since I have a newborn means I got one hour of sleep. But to understand today's story, you have to set your clock back more than just one hour. You have to set your clocks back 12 years, around the year 20 AD, when two seemingly unrelated events happened. An older woman received a terrible diagnosis of chronic illness bleeding that will not stop. And on the same year, another little girl is born. This is the moment when their clocks start running in sync with, an, with one another until 12 years later, their lives intersect with Jesus on one of his busiest days. But the clock goes even further back, 400 years back, to the prophet Malachi, the very last prophet who wrote the very last book in the Old Testament, in the very last chapter before the story of Jesus. And Malachi has a vision that somebody will come and put things right, even though Israel is once again in bondage, even though they are occupied by an enemy army, yet God is sending someone who will set things right. And he says that that person, that Messiah, will be like the sun of righteousness rising with healing in its wings, healing in its rays. And as people reflected on that chapter, they came to understand that what it was saying was that when the Messiah comes, when the Christ comes, he will have healing in the edge of his robe, in the hem of his garment. Because in Hebrew, it's the same word for wing, red, hem. It's the word kanaf. And so this woman knows, she sees that Jesus is in motion, on the way to another healing. But she knows this prophecy. She believes he is the Messiah, and so she goes to fulfill 400 years of prophecy by touching the hem of his garment, proving that Jesus is the Messiah, and receiving healing in her body 12 years later. But people don't know who she is. She is just another face in the crowd, as far as everyone else is concerned. Mark doesn't even tell us her name. But if we set the clocks back even further, Jesus tells us her name. All the way back to the dawn of creation, when Jesus calls her daughter. John tells us that through Jesus Christ, through the eternal word, 
all things were made. You, me, and this woman. And so he looks at her and says, Daughter, your faith has healed you. Your faith has healed you, has saved you. But it's at this moment when it seems like only one of the clocks is going to have a happy ending. Because friends come by, if you can call them friends, and tell Jairus, your daughter is dead. Stop bothering the teacher. And it's actually way ruder than that because what they say in Greek is stop getting under the teacher's skin. It's the Greek word for skinning or scaling, like a fish. Don't get under the teacher's skin with your pain, with your suffering. Your daughter is dead. But the good news here is that Jairus, with his pain, the pain of losing a daughter, is not getting under Jesus' skin. It is the reason he took on skin. As we turn our clocks even further back, past the moment of creation, before the foundations of the world, in Jesus' own being, where we discover that suffering is not an interruption for Jesus. Suffering is Jesus' identity. What we believe in this church is that God is three persons. One being, equal in glory and power, in three persons. God the Father, who is the Creator. God the Spirit, who is the Mover. And God the Son, Jesus Christ, who is the Sufferer, the Savior. It's one of the great problems, the great challenges in classical philosophy and theology. That if God is really God, if He is all-powerful, all-knowing, eternal, in charge of time, how could he possibly suffer and die? It would seem that dying on a cross in 33 AD would be a major change for Jesus. And yet, if God is outside of time, it should be like this equation that Newton wrote. It should be without change. God set in motion should stay in motion, not subject to change over time. And so the solution is that Jesus, when He encounters suffering, when He encounters pain, is not deviating His course. He is on the path He has been since before the foundations of the world. This is really good news for us. Because I think in most of our lives, we think that if someone is bigger, if something gets bigger, it gets less personal. You can contrast two situations in my life. I recently learned the name of one of the librarians at the library. And he loved it. He could not believe I learned his name. And so then he learned my name. He learned George's name. Now, he's my book guy. I only go to this librarian. If I go in, he's not there, no books this week. I get to have a personal relationship with this librarian. But I go to another big corporation every week, and that's Walmart. And Walmart serves a lot more groceries than our library does books. They serve a lot of people. And as Americans, we know, as corporations get bigger, they get less personal. I went to uh, Walmart this week, and they had replaced all but three of the cashiers with self-checkout machines. I couldn't learn that machine's name if I wanted to. Bigger, less personal. But it's just the opposite with God. We think that if we come to God with our problems, that we are imposing on Him, getting under His skin, interrupting Him. But in reality, God is the only being that as He gets bigger, He gets more personal. 
He is stronger. So he is better able to cure you than a team of personal physicians and doctors. He is mightier. So he is better able to know you better than your friend, better than your spouse. To love you more deeply, more personally, more intimately than any being on earth. I think about my own life, something I've preached about before. When I was in high school and I became chronically ill, like the woman in this story. I was sick, I was an invalid for 18 months, had to drop out of school, didn't know if I'd ever go back to school. And as I think about my life, it was an interruption for my life. But it was the time of greatest intimacy I had with God. If you think about a house on fire, if it's your house, that's an interruption. If you're a firefighter, that's your job. That's how it is with God. Our pain, our suffering is not an imposition on him. It is an opportunity for him to continue on the path in the motion that he has been since before creation. He looks down on us now and he sees not a crowd but faces. Individuals whom he loves and whom he died for.